uh, read this morning from Jeremiah. So we're going to take a minute, pull out your Bibles, continue to worship God by, by hearing from him, uh, hearing from his word. Jeremiah chapter 7, that's what we're going to be looking at. As you turn there, uh, this, the book of Jeremiah, obviously Jeremiah is a prophet of God. This is uh, the word of the Lord spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, and he's reading to uh, uh, or speaking to the people of Judah, so the people of God, and, uh, and this is what uh, the Lord had to say to them in chapter 7, verses 1 through 11. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house, and there proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who came through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Reform your ways and your actions And I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. This is the temple of the Lord. If you really change your ways and your actions and deal with each other justly, if you do not oppress the alien, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in the place, in this place, If you do not follow other gods to your own harm, then I will let you live in this place, in the land I have gave your forefathers forever and ever. But look, you are trusting in deceptive words that are worthless. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery and perjury, burn incense to Baal, and and follow other gods you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which bears my name, and say, we are safe? Safe to do all these detestable things? Has this house, which bears my name, become a den of robbers to you? But I have been watching, declares the Lord. All right, so we are in a brand new series. It is the book of Habakkuk. And if you're thinking right now, then why did Pastor Ben read from Jeremiah? That's because Habakkuk was a contemporary contemporary of Jeremiah. They were ministering to the same people in the same time period, dealing with the same sinful responses of the nation of Judah. And so what was read from Jeremiah chapter 7 this morning was describing a heart condition, a behavior condition of a faithless nation. And it is the same faithless nation that Habakkuk is living in and he is addressing his complaints about living among such a people to God. He's in the middle of a crisis. And as we all know, faith can be hard in a crisis. And I don't just mean right now our present crisis that we are going through in our nation, in our world, and there, there's more than one to choose from. But we know that there are always crises that appear in our life. Sometimes the rest of the world seems to be going okay, but what's going on in your own personal life and in your own family is something that is painful and unwanted, and you don't know how to navigate the reality that has suddenly become your life. When you had a plan, you had, you had an anticipation of the way that things should go, and everything goes, as they would say, completely off the rails. And all of your plans get scrapped, and you have to say, I guess there's a new plan, but I don't even, I don't even know where to begin. I don't know where I'm going, and I don't like that this is my new reality. What, what am I to do? And in the middle of that, sometimes we cry out, God, where are you? I don't understand what is happening. I don't like what is happening. And it, it can be hard to have faith and to trust in the middle of such difficulties. And this this is where the prophet Habakkuk is beginning in, in this book in the Bible this morning. 
This morning, we're doing, we're doing an introduction to the book. We're not really going to dive into chapter one, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the historical background about the book of Habakkuk this morning. And then we're going to talk a little bit about other people in the Bible who have dealt with hard times, with doubt, with discouragement, with confronting unexpected hardships in their lives. And hopefully, that will encourage us all the more, not only to, to participate in this series, but to read the book for ourselves. And I would encourage you would go home and read the book of Habakkuk. Um, once a week would be very easy. It's a short three-chapter book. In, in my Bible here, it's, it's on basically two pages. It's, it's, so if you look for it in the table of contents in your Bible, it's an Old Testament, uh, one of the minor prophets, a very short book, but a very pertinent book, a book that speaks to all of us at some point in our life when we say, trust is hard. Trust is hard. Sometimes, I just, I just think, I just think of children. Children are so trusting, right? How you can take your child and you, and you can toss them up in the air and you can catch them. And you can toss them up in the air and you can catch them. And you'll just listen squeal with glee. Like, throw me higher, dad, throw me higher. And I always used to think with my firstborn son, when Garrett would ask me to throw him higher, that you, you haven't seen me play softball, apparently. You, you would not be so confident if and asking me to throw you higher. But they would. They say, throw me higher. And they have the anticipation that they are going to be caught. Now, some people are more naturally fearful, even, even as children. I, I, was, I was one of those. We'd be in the, in the pool, and my dad would, would take my sister, Julie, and he would throw her way up into the air, and then she'd splash down into the deep end. And he'd say, hey, Troy, do you want to do that? I'm like, no, I'm fine right here on the edge. Thank you very much. He said, I, I see what you're doing. It looks like fun, but um, I'm having much more fun watching because I, I had a natural aversion to heights. I, didn't, I did not like my feet leaving the ground. I like to be firmly planted, right? What, what you could see and touch and feel and that weightlessness feeling, that, that, was, that was not my favorite thing to do. But my sister loved it. And, and I remember thinking sometimes, she's having a lot of fun and I, I wish I could let myself be thrown into the air. But I, but I don't want to. I don't want to. I, li I like something firm beneath my feet. But there are times in our life when suddenly we feel like we do lose our footing. No matter how much we, we cling to things like safety and security, where we re suddenly realize we're not in control. We are not the masters of our own destiny. That we can't just plan everything the way that we want it to happen. And all of a sudden we realize, I can't control this. Who can I trust? Habakkuk sees life is not going the way that he expected. And he's saying, God, where are you? God, where are you? And, and God is going to respond to him. So if you, if you are ever, had an, ever had a moment in your life where things have stopped making sense, if you ever want to scream to the sky, what is going on? I don't understand. Then Habakkuk might be the book for you. It's an Old Testament book and one that sometimes gets neglected. But what is going on in this book relates to most of us and eventually to all of us. And so I, I, I hope that we appreciate this and I hope we learn more about who God is and how we can know him better, especially in the hard times and learn to trust him at all times. Okay, so, so who is Habakkuk? He's, he is a prophet. We know this. This is his only writing. He's one of the people in the Old Testament of all the Old Testament authors that we know the least about for certainty. There, he doesn't, we don't have um, an extended genealogy or we don't know his profession for certain. Most people, most biblical scholars believe that he was a musician at the temple. That his job was he was a worshiper. He would lead people in worship. And as he sees what is going on in his country, as he sees uh, falsehood in worship, people coming forward to sing songs and then go out and live unchanged lives, as he begins to see what is going on in the world around him, his heart is grieved and he cries out to God and God responds to him and gives him a word that will be not just for himself, but for all of us. Our 
when, if you want to know when was this written, it was actually very important to know when it was written because it gives us an understanding of why he is so upset and also an understanding of the judgments that God has given. They fall place in a very real historical time, time set. He probably is having these complaints between 620 and 605 B.C. Although, if you were to ask me personally, I think it's going to be between 609 and 605. In this four-year window there. Because what is happening in the nation at that time? What is going on? Well, everything is getting worse. In Habakkuk's life, he had seen a great revival among his people under the King Josiah. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in just a second. He had seen a great revival and people coming back to faith, people refurbishing the temple, people coming back to the Lord, celebrating the Passover under the privilege of a godly king. And he gets to lead those worship services or probably as a musician, be a part of those worship services and just the joy that must have been in his heart as as someone who loved God. And then Josiah dies and everything goes backwards at twice the speed that it went forward. And the people return to their sinful ways. And what was national optimism gives way to despair and foreign powers coming down on the nation. And you can almost hear him saying, it was going so well. We were, we, were, we were coming together. There was this revival. What happened? What happened? And so we see in, in this book, these questions regarding national sin and imminent judgment. And in the background, the rise of Babylon, which if you remember your, your Sunday school lessons... We know that eventually they will be the tool used by God to severely chastise his unfaithful people as they are led away into captivity. Um, it's, a, it's a very unusual book for a prophet. Most prophets give a message to the people from God. The book of Habakkuk is more of a lament. It is the prophet to God and back. It's not to the people in terms of its writing style, although it is for the people, but it is rather the prophet speaking to God and then God speaking to the prophet. It's a back and forth dialogue. And so it does make it very unique. It has a very personal style that you can imagine yourself in the prophet's place as we read it. And then as as we're going to come through this, it's no secret that what we see Habakkuk has taught, one of the most quoted verses, definitely from this book, but of the... the Old Testament, it says, but the just shall live by faith. It's a call to a faithful walk, a walk of faith for the people who know their God. So what's going on? I said I'd give you a little bit of a historical background. What's going on in the land of Judah? Judah, if you remember, was a southern kingdom in the time of Saul and David and Solomon. There was one nation, the nation of Israel. It was a prosperous nation. It was a self-sufficient nation. They, they didn't have foreign countries ruling over them. In fact, in the time of David and Solomon in particular, it was a very, it was, it had, um, authority and, and power over the other nations surrounding them, such as Edom, such as up into Damascus. But the people continued to live in sin. They did not walk in faithfulness. And so the nation was divided into two parts. The northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. The northern kingdom had no good kings. They never followed God in consistency. There were godly examples and godly people in the north. But the ruling class, the kings, they never followed after God. And they led the people into idolatry. And they they led the people astray. And in 722 BC, they were led into captivity by the Assyrian nation. The Assyrian nation is up there on your screen, as you'll see it. It's in green. That's at the larger extent. It would wax and wane in terms of its power. Sometimes the people in Israel and Judah would have autonomy. But a large part of the time, they lived as tribute states, as vassal states. Which meant you can keep being your own nation as long as you pay me a tax to do so. I don't really want to conquer you, but basically it's the big bully on the street. It's like a bad mafia don who says, you need to pay some protection money. So as long as you pay your taxes to us, we will allow you to live as your own independent nation. 
So they're called a vassal state. And every once in a while, you see the kings attacking because a king would start to feel our army is strong enough now. We shouldn't have to pay taxes anymore. And sometimes God would deliver the people from these foreign oppressors. And sometimes he would give them over to the foreign oppressors as a means by which to discipline an unfaithful people. And the Assyrian nation has been the the biggest, baddest bully on the block for quite some time. They are the ones who conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. They are the ones who came up against the king Hezekiah. If you remember Hezekiah, where Sennacherib came up to the walls. They are the ones who have held sway over the region. But then their power began to wane. There's someone else on the block now. Egypt began to have their autonomy back and to begin to be able to step out from under the authority of the Assyrian Empire. And more notable, the Babylonian Empire was rising and they stepped out from under the authority of the Assyrian Empire and said, we have our own armies and now we are the force to be reckoned with. Not only will you not tell us what to do, but we're going to repay you for old grievances. We're going to conquer you. We're going to tell you what to do. And at the same time, as these developments are starting to happen in the world, God gives a king by the name of Josiah to the people of Judah. Josiah was a godly king, raised by ungodly parents and grandparents. He was, in fact, a godly king in the middle of ungodly kings who would go before him and who would follow him. And he began to say, we need to clean up the temple. And so the temple was cleaned. And in it, they found the book of the law. And he read the book of the law. And he said, woe to us. We have forsaken the law of the Lord. We are under his heavy hand. We are rightfully deserving his judgment. What should we do? And he tears down the altars in the high places. He abolishes false worship from the land. And he restores the temple. He calls them all to worship God and God only. And he has the the greatest Passover. And it says of Josiah that no king before him or after him ever turned to God with his whole heart the way that Josiah did. Just a godly example in Bible of a person who comes to Christ and changes 100% and completely and is passionate about serving him and leading people into righteousness. But, but God knew the hearts of the people. And he knew a lot of them were only following in pretense. They were only following him out of ritual. They were willing to set aside their idols as one good luck, ch- luck charm and exchange them for another good luck charm without any real hearts that were seeking to know God. And God declared, even to Josiah, he said, judgment has been pronounced on Judah. And I will not relent. Judgment is coming. But for your sake, it will not happen while you are king. Because you have served me with faithfulness, with a contrite heart. During your lifetime, I will not bring this judgment on the land. And so um, the Assyrian nation, by the way, this yellow up here is at its greatest extent. The yellow was all the area it held power over, not direct authority. It wasn't part of the country. Um, but as those, as that went away, um, the, the people in Babylon, the people in, began to war against the Assyrians. And the people in Egypt, a really curious thing happened. Actually, the, the pharaoh of Egypt, who had been set up by the Assyrian kings, um, felt some loyalty to them. And he was unsure about the Babylonians. So he wanted to help his former masters against a new and unknown ruler, being the Babylonians, whom he had no affinity for or no working relationship with. The kingdom of Judah, on the other hand, had also, had up before this time, curiously had positive relationships with the Babylonians. And they, they had great animosity with the Assyrians. And so that we see in 609 that the armies of Egypt are coming up through, through the plain, through the area that Judah has power over, and into the valley of Megiddo. And Josiah comes out to oppose the Egyptians, to fight our best understanding for the Babylonian cause in opposition to the Assyrians. So people are, are, are 
making their own alliances. And Josiah is killed in battle. And he is laid to rest with his fathers and given, given a memorial of honor. But then we see that his sons, because more than one of them ruled, do not follow in their father's footsteps. Their father had a true conversion, a repentant spirit. But sadly, like most of the nation, they just went through the motions. And immediately the nation goes back to its bad practices of idolatry, of treating each other with oppression, with unkindness, with hard-heartedness. And immediately, the foreign countries again begin to exert their influence over the nation. In fact, Josiah is the first son who became king. Eliakim was, or not Eliakim, was taken away down to Egypt as captive. And they put another son as a king. So we're going to put one here, just to, the Egyptians did, just to let us, them know, the people know that we're in charge. A few years later, the Babylonians would come in after defeating the Egyptians and, and the Assyrians at the Battle of Carchemish and say, no, sorry, Judah, you're no longer property of Egypt. You're now property of us. We're going to put a different king in charge here. And it was a dark times. It was hard times. Probably what happens here is before the Babylonians um, have fully defeated the Assyrians. But we begin to see that God, that Habakkuk is saying, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's just a couple years ago, we were celebrating Passover. I, I, saw, I saw my fellow countrymen praising God, praising God, putting away their idols, making, making vows that they would live holy lives. And, and, and today I look out in the streets, I look at the temples and I see people come in and they walk in and they, they profess that they know God, but then they go out and they, there's no change. And then they go out and they even worship other gods in addition to the true God in, in a way that is just a mockery of right religion. And he's crying out, God, where are you? I love my nation, but I'm in distress. I don't understand. I'm upset by the wickedness, by the departure from truth. And he says, where are you? But then we see that God answers. And God answers. You know, when, when we're living this life, it's kind of like watching a train. We see the trains go by one car at a time. And sometimes when you're sitting there and when you're caught at, at the train tracks, it can seem like that train is never ending. You know, car after car go by on the train track. And we can say, when does this end? What's the point? But I, I hope we realize as believers that God sees things from a different point of view. He sees everything from the top. He sees the beginning, he sees the end, and he sees the middle. Sometimes the middle is hard, and sometimes the middle is necessary. But God is working all things together for his own good purposes. And we are called to trust him, and not just blindly trust. God doesn't, doesn't just say, trust me, although there are answers. He, he does not give us um, an answer in the way we would want, perhaps. But he is calling us to know him more deeply. And, and he does, he says, that the just shall live by faith. The Bible is full of people who had disappointment, who had pain, and who had doubt. And you know, it's okay to have doubt. And this is one thing I want you to understand coming into this book. It's okay to have a crisis of faith. It's okay to have honest doubts. It's okay to say, I'm hurting, and I'm not okay with it right now. Because all through the Bible, we see examples of other people, men and women of God, who tearfully sought the Lord and said, I don't understand. The whole book of Job, we could start there, on a man who went through horrible affliction and personal loss. Or David, how he was angry with God when they, when they were setting up the materials to build the temple that his son Solomon would build. And we see him in 2 Samuel chapter 6. They were bringing the Ark of the Covenant to the holy city of Jerusalem. And the oxen stumbled and Uzzah reached out and touched it and he was struck dead by the Lord. And he was, he was angry, the Bible says, at God. God had to remind him that this happened because you were sinning in, in David's case. You were, you were violating my expressed commandments. The Ark was never to be carried 
on a cart, ever. The ark was only to be carried by the priests. And by your foolishness and your haste, an innocent man lost his life because you were living in disobedience. Sometimes, when we're honest, we see that some of our pain, sometimes much more than we want to acknowledge, is because of exactly what we have brought on ourselves. But not always. It's a, it's a good place to start and say, God, if there's anything that I'm doing to bring this on myself, please reveal it to me. I want to confess it. I want to make it right with you. We, we want to make sure we take care of the things for which we are directly responsible. But it's not always the case. And I don't want you to hear the sermon and say, something bad is happening in my life, so I must be sinning. That is not always the case. There are many people in Scripture that were not living in sin that had afflictions happen to them. We think of Joseph and his affliction, right? When he was taken by his brothers and cast into the cistern and then enslaved in Egypt and then falsely accused and thrown into prison. And all of these things happened to him. And at the end of the book, he says, you meant these things for evil, but God meant it for good. It's not always because we are the ones who are sinning. But you wonder, how many nights did Joseph just look at the ceiling and say, I I, I don't get it. I don't understand. We, We see John the Baptist. John the Baptist didn't understand. Here's a man who was called by God to announce the coming of the Messiah. And Jesus comes on the scene. He says, he must increase. I must decrease. I'm gonna step into the background. I'm not even worthy to tie the straps of his sandals. And he has he had, had such a great ministry and even the privilege of baptizing Jesus. So here's a man who's been in the highest of highs of this exalted position, but in his final years on this earth was taken by an evil king because of his message. And he's imprisoned and he begins to doubt and to question and to wonder and, And to say, this isn't what I expected. I was announcing the kingdom was coming. How is this the kingdom? I don't see it. I don't understand. So he sends messengers over to Jesus in Matthew chapter 11. And he says, are you the one or not? If you're the one, why am I in prison? And then Jesus said in verse verse 4 of Matthew 11, Go and tell John the things which you hear and which you have seen. The blind see and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. And it seems like a rebuke. But right after that, Jesus says to the crowd, there is no man born of woman greater than John. He commends him. He doesn't say, oh, don't be like John. Look at him. He's having a crisis of faith. He's he's a backslider. No, he says, there's no one greater than John. So if John the Baptist has doubts, if John the Baptist has a crisis of faith, it's pretty reasonable to think that we might too. And it would be better that we knew where to turn in the middle of that crisis of faith before they hit. But even if you're already there, to know that God is okay with your doubts and your questions, he's okay with your heartache, he's even okay with your anger. He is big enough to handle it. And he is exactly where we need to turn when we have questions. I hope we understand that there's a responsibility to us as listeners. Just because we have doubt doesn't mean we can, we can engage in sin. That's stupid, right? I don't understand why bad things are happening, so I'm inviting more bad things into my life. That's just, that's just foolishness. So, so don't do that. We are still called to behave responsibly, but also to be able to engage with God honestly. You don't have to pretend that you have it all together when you go to God, because he already knows where you're at. He's not like, oh, you know, I, I, thought, I thought that Troy was kind of upset with me, but that prayer was just so eloquent today that apparently, apparently we're okay. No, I'm not fooling God. God knows my heart. And he's like, nice words and nice flowery uh, little petition, but why don't you be honest with me and tell me what's really bothering you? We, we, we can be honest with God. Habakkuk was honest. And he came to God for answers. And that, that's the other thing. 
when we take our questions to God and we wrestle with God, that are we seeking answers or are we just trying to justify our unbelief? That's another thing we'll talk about in this series a little bit. A lot of people come to God with questions because they really just want an excuse to do what they want to do. Not so with us who are honestly coming to God for answers. We're not trying to justify unbelief, but rather we're trying to say, God, I'm seeking your face. I want to know you. I I want to grow my trust of you. See, doubts and questions are an opportunity for us to draw closer to God and to know him more in a new way. They're unwanted. I'll I'll acknowledge they're usually unwanted. But the way that we can experience God as he walks with us through life is to know him more deeply, to have a better appreciation of our circumstances, to know him in the completeness of his love and character and sovereignty, that he will be found by those who truly seek him. And the Bible says that. And all throughout the Bible, people have cried out, I don't want to do this. I don't like this. Jesus did that in the garden, right? Lord, if you're willing, take this cup from me. He was headed into an unwanted time. But where did he even turn? As he demonstrated perfect obedience. But he went to the Father in prayer and said, nevertheless, your will be done. There's lots lots of great examples other than Habakkuk in the Bible. Um, There's Abram, Abraham, we read in Romans 4.20, it says, did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. And therefore, Romans chapter 4, it was accounted to him for righteousness. And the Bible reminds us that, that growing in faith is a necessity for God's children. Hebrews chapter 11 Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And and here's the thing that I've had to work really hard at in my life. I told you, I don't like being thrown into the air. Still don't. I like roller coasters, but that's something for another sermon. But I can still feel the feet under my, the, the, uh, I can still feel the floor under my feet, right? But I don't like that weightlessness. I have no control feeling of just falling. I'm, I'm very much a, I want to live by sight, not by faith type person in my basic nature. So when I come to you here, I don't want you to be like, oh, that's you just having pastor talk. No, we are called to live by faith and not by sight because we need to trust God and not our own devices. We need to draw closer to him. And, and too many times we trust our own plans. We don't trust God. Because Hebrew eleven six also says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Or as we read here in Habakkuk, the just shall live by his faith. Habakkuk is yelling out. um, Here, look at these verses just pop up. Habakkuk is yelling out, how do I make sense of the world that I live in? That's That's a question for today. That's a question for us all as individuals. And the great answer is that God has the answers. If we will truly seek him with our whole heart, he will be found. There's there's a close with this. There's a chapter in the Bible that many of you are familiar with. We read it a lot around Easter, particularly Good Friday. And it's, it's a prophecy of the suffering that Jesus Christ went through. Um, It's Psalm chapter 22, and it talks about the nature of the crucifixion, which is pretty crazy because this was written a long time before crucifixion even became a type of punishment. But it describes it and gives a lot of details of what Jesus Christ himself would endure. And we remember that we remember the beginning. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and the word from the words of my groaning? And we think of how Jesus cried that out on the cross. And and I've heard a lot of sermons on that saying, even Jesus was forsaken. Which, obviously we know his sin cut him off from that perfect communion from the Father. And we know it was a very horrible time. But here's the thing, that Christ was not forsaken. Do Do you understand he was never forsaken? He was cut off. 
He was under extreme anguish. But we have to read this psalm in its entirety. Because when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? They didn't have the numbers. He wasn't saying, hey, guys, look at Psalm 22. As a matter of fact, at that time when they had it, it was, they would read the first line of the song. Psalm 23 was, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 22 is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So when he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is, in an essence, saying, what you witness in the psalm is being fulfilled in your presence. That's not really the point of this conclusion. But what I want you to see, after you go through all of the affliction and all the questions that are natural of that kind of situation, what do we see in verse 21? Make sure I'm right here. Verse 21. You have answered me halfway through that verse. You have answered me. He cries out to God, why have you forsaken me? It appears that you have forsaken me. And then he says, no. You have answered me. I will declare your name to my brethren in the midst of the assembly. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised nor abhorred abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard. Did you catch that? Here is the lament of the psalmist. Here's the cry of Jesus saying, where are you when this is happening? Here's the cry of the prophet Habakkuk saying, God, where are you? And sometimes it's our cry. But God says, I have heard. And I hope you join us in this study as we see what God has to say to the prophet who has questions. And that we will hopefully gain confidence that though our life may not go according to plan, our plans, that we are never outside of God's attention or the stretch of his hand. And he hears those who cry out to him. We're going to have a a good series, maybe a challenging series, but the truth of God spoken to give us comfort and confidence and to help us to walk with him. Let's pray.